it has nothing on you. You're a survivor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my, it's good to have you back. Oh yes, and I'm glad to be back on uh, AMA. <laughs> yeah. I I love these things. <laughs> we missed you too. <laughs> Hi, Ian. Hi. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone who is joining. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mr. You, guys, Grief. you guys ready for some surprises? <laughs> look at this. I have to look for my <laughs> swag. Yeah. I'm gonna join the swag party. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm just going to hunt down Marco. Oh, oh, yeah, there's Vitor. Nice. Hey, guys. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> no, I got it. Cool. Oh, yeah. Look at all that swag. Yeah. The shop is down again, but we're gonna get this thing back up because look at how look at how awesome this is, you know? This is, it's so yeah. critical, clearly. Uh, well, I guess we can we can get started. Uh, you know, the por purpose of the purpose of this AMA is really dive into the idea of uh, collaborative economics and the the whole like idea of we are smart enough to design our own economies. We don't have to follow the old like, oh, people are too dumb to take agency over their collective, uh, you know, success. Uh, this is that was the that was the framing behind monarchies and and then hey, democracy seemed to work out okay. Maybe we can do something with economics too. So uh, the TE Commons is really. Uh, uh, taking the common stack tooling and running with it. And we're very lucky to have Marco, Mitch, and Vitor who really pushed out this, uh, this dashboard, the, the te, uh, config.tecommons.org, which you guys should all check out. Super cool. Uh, and uh, if anyone has any questions about collaborative economics, it's an AMA. So feel free to just jump in and, and ask them. Uh, Mar Marco did the design uh, for the dashboard. Mitch kind of took on prog project management and a lot of a lot of the filling in the gaps. And Vitor was the lead developer and also did a lot of project management. So we have the whole team. Thanks for the introduction, Griff. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to suggest uh, like a quick intro from us from the team who actually did this thing and developed. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself for the people who don't know me on this call. So my name is Marco, and I'm responsible. I was responsible and still am for uh, the interaction design, visual design, and UX of the Commons configuration dashboard. Um, we did a lot of, well, say, uh, research and then a lot of work between among us and did some user testing on, on the, on the dashboard itself. Uh, we tried our best to, uh, make the, uh, user experience, um, the best possible, right? Uh, this is a completely new thing that we built here. So we, we, we assumed a lot of uh, things on our own. Um, we did also some of the user testing, uh, but we don't say that we had all the answers right. So um, we would love you to um, use this tool, uh, get back to us with any feedback. Uh, and if you have any suggestions on how to improve the user flows and maybe some of the user experience or find some bugs or whatever, uh, you know, I'm here to answer those questions, uh, and I will. Yeah, I will just pass it over to Mitch. Maybe you give a quick intro of your what you did on this project, and yeah, just deliver context. Uh, thanks, Marco. Uh, yeah, I started from initially doing the ideation with uh, Griffin, Marco, just kind of how we want to set this up, how we want to frame, you know, teaching everybody about the different parts of the commons and how we want to set it up. Um, and then I did 
most of the copywriting, like on the learn modules and the tool tips, but there was a lot of QA involved from people like like Lauren and Marco and Griff and everyone else that was in the, those parameters calls. Um, and then really just like making sure that the designs matched up with the development and you know a little bit of like issue reporting and some some coding here and there. Um, so yeah, kind of like I've been helping with this project from front to back and uh, I'm super excited hopefully to show it off later, but um, I'll pass it to Vitor. Hey guys, yeah, I've been working the development of this tool and basically the process was to, to first get the models that we were using first, like for the smart contracts for the TC, etc. and try to man to to manage these into a more simpler way that people could understand and then uh, once we have these models, try to make it uh, usable and try to make it to make it more intuitive for people. So we had a lot of interactions from the design side and from like user testing for getting sure that everything makes sense, which was really, really interesting to, to get something that complex into an easy way to, to play with and understand. And I've been working mostly on the backend side, but I, I, I have I uh, talk a lot with the front end and try to manage things to make everything work fine and get, get it as much understandable as possible. So if you guys don't understand the part or if the model is a little bit complex, you can blame on your talk and try to find a way to, to improve it. And I think that's it. Yeah, and I just, I just like to add um, that uh, we, like uh, three of us here or four of us, or maybe five with Lauren, <laughs> uh, don't take the full credit. Of course, uh, there were many other people who work on this project. Uh, a lot of invaluable input that we got from the common stack community, from the TEC community as well. Um, a lot of people that helped in and did, the, did some user testing, uh, did, the, um, did some of the researches, uh, did their, their, you know, show their, and also provided their expertise. So yeah, there are many other people, um, and that they deserve the praise as well. So I just wanted to mention that here as well here. And back to you, Griff, if you want to say something, or if we have like an open AMA or anyone has any questions, yeah. feel free to shoot. It's an open AMA, but here, I, I can start with one. What's your favorite parameter? Uh, Mine? Yeah. <laughs> wow, this is a tough one. Um, hmm. We were just on the param score call uh, an hour ago, or what? Well, I can't say which my parameter is. Hmm. I'd say I I I'd say um, support required. <laughs> yeah, maybe support required. But then then also on the conviction voting part, the, there are a few others. So it's hard. It's hard to pick one, obviously. And why? Why do you like support required? Because I I always get at this point like okay how like how much like how many of us need to support this uh and and i like this number to be high you know uh like we discussed on the like in previous calls some of you people disagree with that uh i would go in crazy as 100 percent, you know <laughs> like okay that's too much okay, okay that's too much right but like because i believe uh you know in order to like move things forward in an economy, like in a community, um, we need as much as people who are, you know, sharing um, the same, I wouldn't say thoughts or, well, um, I, I say we need a lot of people engaged, right? We need them engaged. We don't have just to be, uh, you know, sitting aside and watching, you know, how things are uh, you know, happening, but actually be engaged in, in the community and be engaged in the, the whole thing. And so that's the reason why I would love, well, I always, you know, stay at this number and think, oh, okay, we need a lot of support here. We want people just to be much, much more engaged. So, yeah, I think that's the reason why I chose this parameter. Nice. I have a question. Um, uh, how other communities can deploy this technology, these uh, arms, these uh, amazing thing you have created so far? <laughs> uh, 
Well, maybe, maybe I'll jump in for this one because it really it's very specific for designing a commons. So I think that other gardens communities might be able to use the tool just on the TE Commons website to kind of play with how to parameterize their own conviction voting app. But then uh, uh, it's really almost like the second step in the common stack deployment. It's like first we, they have to have a hatch and then they do the upgrade. And so they have to have a set m amount of money and uh, an initial token um, distribution for this tool to really work. And, uh, and so it's a little bit complicated, but hopefully we'll go back and we'll make the hatch really fun to, to play with. And then people can kind of use the hatch and then use the common swarms product of actually deploying a DAO and doing the fundraise thing. And so they collectively design the hatch, then they do a fundraise, then they collectively design the commons upgrade, and then they, then they launch their economy. So it'll probably be, it'll take some handholding for the next several months, I would assume before anyone can just deploy it. So that would be like a, a good practice. Do, do you add another one in order to be a successful deployment for these communities that maybe are interested in this kind of a, a technology to, to deploy their, their, their commons? Totally. Well, what about you, Mitch? What's your favorite parameter? Um, I would say the entry tribute. Yeah, that's my favorite one. Um, just kind of dictates like how, how incentivized people are to buy TEC tokens, right? You know, if it's like, oh, I don't want to pay that much, you know, tribute and, you know, so we can kind of, we can control a lot of things that way by setting the entry tribute higher or lower. And uh, do I pass it? Okay, cool. I'll give it to Vitor. Yeah, like, I like a lot of the, <clears throat> all the augmented bonding curve parameters, but I think, uh, really crucial for the economic to be sustainable in the middle long term but what i think differentiates the uh the, the model a lot is the conviction voting because then uh especially the conviction growth and the relative spending limit there you can like do uh really different uh dynamics especially with uh how can you vote so you can have a higher conviction growth and you can have like have the people just to, st uh, to stake their tokens to vote in the proposal for longer to have more more power so we will uh, avoid layers to keep changing the proposal voting to pass a specific one and also the relative spending so you can define that uh, a, a proposal can get really not, not a lot of funds or it can have like bigger proposals so i think when you do that you change the characteristics of the proposals that pass and the like outputs of the commons and the projects that are funded by so i think the relative spending limit and conviction growth uh, I think are my favorite. Yeah, and you, Ruth. Oh, for me? Yeah, uh, or your favorite ones. I, I feel like opening price is really interesting, honestly. You know, it's like, well, do, do we could just start the opening price at $1, you know, or we could start it at, at $3. You know, it's like everyone in the hatch paid $1 for it. How much like like it's just straight like profit do the hatchers get for being hatchers is a very interesting dynamic and then also but the interplay with the reserve ratio and how you know how much slippage we want to allow in and like how how backed how like um conservative we want to be with the bonding curve you know and, and interplaying those two um needs uh, is uh is really interesting to me uh, Nick, I saw you on mute. I'm curious to hear what you were going to say. Um, I'm just going through the tutorial right now on the params dashboard that um, you all made. And I just had a couple questions just from the first part. So um, in the token freeze and token full part of the tutorial, it says that um, Tokens are locked for some time until a linear function is implemented to unlock the tokens, rendering them liquid at a setting trickle. Um, why? 
like what what's the benefit of um making it liquid at a steady trickle mm -hmm. so instead of so the thing is with the i'm just gonna do you mind if i pop this open griff and then maybe it'll be easier to understand all right, let's go to config T commons. And uh, let's have a look at this here. So I hear you talking about uh, the first one. So token freeze and token thaw. And so um, basically here, what we're trying to do is not for the advantage of the hatchers, so the initial investors and the builders, but more for the benefit of the commons or the organization. And so basically this gives the commons a bit of time to like organize and start generating value. Because if all of a sudden we set the opening price to $5 and everyone can just sell their tokens immediately, that presents like a problem for the commons because it didn't actually have a chance to get started and all of a sudden everybody's dumped their tokens so we give this freeze and a thaw as sort of like a grace period for the commons to start and then either shortening it or lengthening it essentially determines that grace period got it so basically the whole point is to give some time so that projects within the TEC can be made to prove that this community is valuable, therefore tokens value. Exactly. Generating value from the token by actually making the organization or its goals valuable or generating value. And um, in the tutorial, there's also... So... Um, in the token freeze and token flow forum post, it says that um, this process permits enough time for economic activity to occur. So that economic activity is value building thing then. Yeah, exactly. And also, well, I don't know if you want to dive into the, the whole thing in general, Griff. Like, does everyone seem pretty like rock solid with what's happening in it? Or is it worth um, maybe going in and explaining a couple of things before we dive in? Um, so I'm, the learn modules are all there and they're, you can just go in there, you can read them all. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to the tool because that's the fun part that I like to talk about. And so, um, what you're saying there, Nick, is like, you're asking about like what we define by, um, uh, generating economic activity, right? Yes. Yeah, so basically part of that is um, the value of the token going up, so the TEC generating value, but also the economic activity that will be created by the augmented bonding curve, right? So uh, just to give a little bit of context on this thing is basically this is going to be the primary market for how TEC token is traded versus XDAI. And so people can put in XDAI into this at a rate that's determined by the bonding curve and they receive TEC. Um, and so that's pretty similar to like if you think of how like a DEX sort of works and you can exchange tokens and it's all kind of like seamless and you don't need like a second party to, to buy or sell tokens on the other end. But on top of this, we've added another function, which is the entry and exit tribute which I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. And so basically, whenever somebody is making a buy order into the augmented bonding curve, um, we levy a fee or a tribute, I guess you could say, right off the top that's denominated in XDAI, and that goes into the common pool, so the pool that we're using to fund the TEC projects. And then conversely, on the other end, when you're um, taking money out, so you're putting in TEC and you're withdrawing your XDAI, then we have the exit tribute, which also levies uh, an independent fee that we're able to set. So by that, by having volume on our primary market, we're also generating, we're generating revenue for the TEC to start actually like funding projects. That makes so much more sense now. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's you cut there. 
I mean, they're all in interconnected, right? So it's hard to just like single out one slice and be like, it doesn't make sense because it's like they're all complementary. I just wanted to ask you, Griff, um, what was your intention for the call? Like, did you want to dive into the dashboard itself or? I think you're already halfway through it. So maybe just finish, finish going to the other ones. And, and uh, I hope that other people, you know, it's an AMA. So that the general style is uh, expecting okay. a little bit of like questions and, and free flow. Like if, uh, uh, especially if anyone who's played with the dashboard has any questions, that's really good. And, you know, you have the developers here. To, so you have, you have all the experts that could help. So, uh, yeah, any any questions, feel free to interrupt, honestly. Okay. I, I have something real quick. Yeah. So if I put in a spending limit of 99%, a minimum conviction of 51%, and a conviction growth of one day, it, it pushes the curve. Like, I, it, it disappears off the top of the screen at about 30%, and it enters the screen at about 50%. Like, it, it, does, it seems like it, this is – I don't understand what I'm seeing. <laughs> well, uh, well they, go ahead. I mean, you just you said no, no. Go ahead, Vitor. Take it. No, yeah, but uh, um, like on the y-axis, you have the uh, percentage of conviction that it can have. Like the the can you go to the okay? Now I can see your sorry. Like on the y-axis, you have the total effective effective supply. So imagine the total conviction that you can have on, and on the x-axis, you have like the amount of, that you can request. So, like, you cannot request, you cannot have, like, more than 100% of the total conviction, right? And then when you set the minimum conviction to 51%, you're saying that you're going to have, like, 51% of the total effective supply to vote on that. So, like, 51% of the total tokens people holding and, have to be on that. So, and they're, they're locked to a particular vote. So, that would, that would be a huge number. Yeah, and th that's why, like, that's why, uh, for example, you cannot, uh, if you uh, keep like 51%, you cannot get more than, let's say, 20 something percent of the 20, 20 something percent of the total uh, poll. So basically, this minimum conviction offsets, like, what's the minimum that you can that you need? You can set this like to zero, and then you will have the same regular curve. But what you're doing is basically is off, not exactly, but you're offsetting like what's the minimum needed to to pass something. Imagine that in our curve, like if we add the minimum conviction of 5%, even if I want to request a really, really small proposal, I will need to have at least 5% of the total tokens voting, total effective, effective supply to pass something. So this kind of, it is another future to have kind of the, the common signaling, basically. So that's why if you add like 51%, it's like, <laughs> it's like the majority of getting crazy, man. You're getting crazy. Getting crazy. Like, yeah. Those parameters are too crazy. Um, and maybe just to give some context to this, this whole module in itself. Um, so when we were looking at the, um, the augmented bonding curve, right? So the economic engine, we mentioned that those tributes were going into the common pool, right? Which the common pool is going to be used to fund the projects of the org and the commons and so on. Um, but then what this thing here deals with is the system, the voting system by which we'll actually be dispersing funds. So how can people ask for funds uh, from our organization to fund projects? And so this is conviction voting. And basically here we have this concept of conviction which is time and tokens that's put into like a sort of like a logarithmic, I think, or is it quadratic? Anyway, it's, it's, got, it's, got a, it's got this nice smooth curve to it, basically, that you can dictate through conviction growth. And so if we open it up here, you can see that when you put in tokens, when you vote in favor of a proposal, you're staking the tokens that you own into it. You're signaling that you're in favor of this proposal, you put your tokens in it, you're like, I back this. Um, and so basically those tokens accrue conviction over time. And so you're dictating how quickly or how slowly they accrue conviction by the conviction growth. And so you can set it lower or higher, and you can say it would take more or less time to accrue more conviction. And there is a threshold in there that says when 
proposal X reaches Y amount of conviction, then the proposal passes. And so the funding request becomes successful, the funds are dispersed, and then the project receives the money. And then the spending limit here dictates like the max amount of funds that we can disperse at a single from a single proposal. This number is basically impossible to attain because this would assume that 100% of the token supply is voting on this proposal. And like that would be extremely unlikely. So it would be more reasonable to like 100% of the tokens are voting on this proposal with 100% conviction. So, I mean, that would take like all the tokens for like a ridiculous amount of time to be staked on proposal in order for it to pass. So we can assume the spending limit is like kind of this imaginary thing over there. That's kind of the anchor point for everything behind it. So if we wanted to get like 18 or 17 percent, like it kind of sets the threshold where we want it. And then the minimum conviction just kind of says like, even if we wanted like a tiny bit of money, like how much of the actual supply needs to be voting on a proposal. And uh, yeah, I don't know if it was that clear to anybody for conviction voting conviction. Marco's a pro now. He just he was at the last pram party. What is the status of an application to actually do conviction voting? To clearly like, collect votes. So I think the uh, like an actual application that's live now that's using conviction voting. Is that your question? Yeah, honestly, I am interested in doing a DAO, doing a connecting a DAO to a Gnosis safe. And I wanted to have one. I wanted to use a DAO to do conviction voting. And I don't. It's something I could connect to Gnosis through an intermediary oh. contract. Connect, connecting to Gnosis is not necessarily the easiest way to go, go. The only implementation of conviction voting that's live right now is by OneHive on XDAI. Uh, it works through, uh, it's been going for over a year and they've been using it to manage the, their own economy. And we're actually um, building on top of Gardens, which is their deployment for it. So there's no direct plug into like the Zodiac uh, ecosystem with Gnosis Safe. But you can use gardens if you deployed with gardens. Well, you could integrate Gnosis safes. Okay, yeah, because ceramic has a. Uh, um, you can own a so the controller of a ceramic stream can be a Gnosis safe, and so I'm wanting to play around with that some. Super cool. Well, Joel is super excited about conviction voting like OED, and uh, he has a. Uh, been trying to get it on ceramic for a little bit, and that's definitely like after um, after we launch the TE Commons, I think Sem is going to be working with him a little bit to try to figure out a way to get conviction voting on ceramic uh, natively. So it's in the works, but it'll probably take a year or something. Mitch, do you want to go through DAO voting as well? Oh, hell yeah, I do. Yeah, so this is the other part, which will be um, part of our decision-making process. So, you know, it's still related to conviction voting in, in that we're still talking about governance of the commons. And so this um, specifically pertains to how do we change the settings of our DAO post-launch. So if we want to change the entry tribute, the exit tribute, we wanted to change uh, things in conviction voting, like the spending limit and, or like, it, it's really limitless, but these are like the basic use cases. Um, how, what kind of voting would we use to make those decisions, right? Because it's not the same metrics that we're looking at for when we're making funding requests. And honestly, these are like pretty, sketchy things like you could do a lot of things with cow voting and so they need to have basically rock solid settings to make sure that you don't compromise the integrity of your commons and so uh, if you're familiar with dandelion voting or any sort of like yes no uh, voting sort of uh, application or method 
Uh, you can see you've got support required, you know, the amount of yes votes that need to happen on a proposal. The minimum quorum is interesting because it's a, the percentage of the token supply that's voting yes on this proposal. So regular quorum is just the amount of people that are present for a vote. But this is actually the percentage that are voting yes on it of the token supply. Um, vote duration, pretty straightforward. So the amount of time that the vote is eligible to be voted on. And then the delegated voting period is where it gets interesting because in DAO voting, we have a concept where you can actually uh, vest your vote to a delegate who will vote on your behalf. And so these delegates can, be have, can have multiple votes for them and then they will basically cast your vote or expect your vote on your behalf. And so this, is, this delegated voting period is different from the vote duration. It is a portion thereof. It is a portion of the beginning. So if we say that the vote duration is seven days, if you're a delegate, you're only allowed to cast your vested votes within five days of that portion. And this is especially important because if a delegate votes contrary to what you would have normally voted on, you can retake that vote back you can essentially veto it and you can recast it yourself. And so giving that little grace period where delegates stop voting allows you to verify how your delegate voted and choose to take action or not. Uh, from there, we've got another interesting metric, which is the quiet ending period. And so this is in the latter portion of the vote duration. And basically this will listen to see if there was a change of voting outcome in that specified duration. So it'll, for example, here on my screen there, it says three days. So three days from the end of the vote duration, if the outcome of the vote flips from yes to no or no to yes, it will add an extension onto the vote duration. And that extension is defined by the next one, which is the quiet ending extension. So it's, it's in there, it's near the end, like maybe in the last two days or something, a whale comes in and casts their vote, it flips. And then in order to give the community time to process that, we add an extension. And if you have not already voted, there is more time for people to cast their vote. Because in DAO voting, you can only vote once. So nobody can go back and change their votes. But what this is, is this adds more time to get more community input. And then same thing here, if during this extension it flips again, we add another extension. And if it changes again during that extension, like, you know, we can just keep on tacking them on. So, you know, I don't know. I, I think it was unlimited, Griff, or did we pick a number for it, like six or something like that? Uh, I'm sorry, for, for what exactly? Quiet ending extension. Uh, I believe it's unlimited. So it's like... Unlimited. Uh, is people can't... Yeah, it's unlimited, So, but the people can't change their votes. So if it's really contentious, then you know, and it keeps changing in every extension, and we just keep voting, eventually people run out of votes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then the final parameter here is the execution delay. So this is the period between the end of the vote to when the execution, when the, the outcome is actually executed, right? So if we voted to change the entry tribute, it passes, we must wait that one day, for example, until that parameter is actually changed. So that's pretty much, that's pretty much DAO voting. It's like kind of like yes, no voting, but there's like some more interesting features just to keep it a little bit more airtight. And also the delegated thing removes the overhead from individual voters of always having to like, you know, be alert and voting and, and stay 100% engaged. Uh, does anyone have any questions for DAO voting? I have a kind of tangential question. Shoot. What is uh, opinions on source cred? Opinions on source cred as a method, as a mechanism for distributing tokens. Funny you mentioned that. Yeah, because uh, I think we're we're building a reward system as well in the TEC that will be uh, leaning heavily on source cred to distribute rewards. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Any more tangential questions? 
Maybe, maybe I can drive off the idea of source cred on, on and versus the common stack design pattern. Honestly, source cred was a huge influence on, on why the common stack took this route. Source cred, in my opinion, is one of the best methods for bootstrapping a community through labor. Uh, if you want to reward people for their work directly and just say, hey, uh, let's start an economy around this work that's being produced. SourceCred has all the tools to track and design a token issuance policy, right? And because SourceCred has, has been killing it, uh, we actually took a different path where we're bootstrapping uh, public goods focused economies through, uh, through donation effectively, through investment, through, through, uh, through capital. And so it's, a, it's a, actually an alternative design pattern. And I think they're very complementary. Uh, and that's why we also have our own praise system that we use to reward labor and so that labor and capital can, uh, can initialize the economy. Uh, but, uh, but effectively, the common stack design pattern is focused more like on allowing donors to start their own economy. Uh, so it's, it's kind of just like their source cred and common stack design pattern are like incredibly complementary. And but at the same time, they're kind of solving the problem, the real problem, which is how do we fund public goods uh, and 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 uh, create abundance economics? But from uh, we're starting with different uh, initial conditions. And I saw Nick unmute again. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say that was super cool. <laughs> everything that you guys are talking about here. So it's just like, if we can keep talking about everything, that'd be awesome. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the best part. I mean, look at these designs, though. I want to just talk about that for a second. Like, these are really, really cool. But I, looking at this, this is the beast here that we want to get into. And like... I can't give props to, to Vitor and, and the team behind this that built this because this is like, this tool here was incredibly complicated. Like, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but it like, even me and Marco just like putzing around ideas, this seemed incredibly complicated and Vitor pulled it off somehow. Um, so this is basically a tool for like simulating an augmented bonding curve and putting transactions on it and seeing the data come out in real time. And so I was, we mentioned the opening price, I think in this call, or maybe it was the last param party, but um, this is basically like the price, we get to decide the price that we uh, want the TEC token to be worth at launch. So we decided in the hatch that we were gonna set for every one X die contributed into the hatch, uh, hatchers, so the, the investors, I guess you could say, would get one TCH token. And that TCH token is worth one TC token. So, you know, it's a one to one the whole way across. But then when we launch this augmented bonding curve, when we launch our economy, we can basically stamp the price onto the TC token however we wish. And so there's obviously there's pros and cons to having higher or lower and all that stuff. But in the in the dashboard, you can choose what you want that to be. Um, the commons tribute. So we were talking about having like a funding pool that becomes the common pool for funding projects. And then the other side is the reserve balance. And so the reserve balance is actually going to be the money that backs our bonding curve. And so basically you can use the commons tribute to dictate the ratio of how much goes where, right? So if you want 50, 50 split, you want, from your hatch funds, which was in the case of our hatch was $1.57 million. Uh, we can choose to put 50% of that right away into funding projects and 50% to back our economy with. But you can choose that however you wish and that's just done with commons tribute. Uh, entry and exit tribute we already mentioned. And then getting down to the tool itself, you can see the bonding curve is, is simulated right here on the graph. And the reserve ratio here basically dictates the price volatility as tokens are bought and sold on our curve, right? And so you'll see the curve takes on a different shape depending on the reserve ratio. And we can actually, 
from this tool at the bottom here, choose how much money we'd like to simulate the curve is at. So based on the shape, we can look at it from 500 to 1 million to 3 million. But for the example of here, we'll just go with launch. So we assume that 50% of the hatch funds is going to the reserve balance to our bonding curve. And from here, you can see that there's a couple steps that are already generated. We've got bullish or bearish, which basically just identifies the preset transactions here. So basically, we imagine if there's like a small buy, a big buy, and then a small sell, or like a, a small buy, a big sell, and then a, a small sell. And then these are basically just meant to demonstrate like how the settings that we chose work and the, just some data to contextualize it. So you can see here, if we click on them, we can actually see the steps themselves show up on the curve. We can see some pretty cool data, like we can see the current price, we see the amount that goes in. So it's, for example, here we have the initial buy, which is another f fun thing we could talk about. But um, we basically imagine that, boom, we're putting in 250,000 XDAI. And based on our setting, we put 7,500 XDAI that goes straight into our common pool, right, from our tributes that we defined. Um, from this buy, we receive 128,000 TEC tokens, and the price movement jumps from 165 all the way up to 214. And then so on and so forth. You can see that in all the scenarios, but the cool thing is that when you're done with that, you can start adding in your own. So we've got this thing here. If we want to say, I want to buy um, 420,000 X die worth of TEC tokens, we can add that onto our bonding curve. And boom, it generates a simulated transaction. And then we can see all the relevant data there. And if we wanted to do that, like we could do it again, we could buy another 420,000. And then we could see the price movement there. And the TEC tokens that were received, we can see the price slippage or the difference, uh, the relative difference of the price when it moves. And then we can also do the same thing with sell. So we could take away tokens, put in TEC tokens and receive XDAI. Okay, to, to let me be, let me see if I'm sure what I'm looking at. So is this, so when, when a buy or when a, yeah, when a buy happens and the price goes up, some curve is determining how much that price will go up based on the, the size of the buy. Yeah. So let me, let me dive into like uh, what a bonding curve is really quick. So a bonding curve is the solution for micro economies. That's why it's so important because it provides infinite liquidity. It's a single sided market where uh, before, before this, like I, I, I say this a lot, no bonding curves, Simon de la Rouvier, who invented bonding curves, will win a Nobel Prize in economics because this is the first example of a single sided market. If you wanted to buy something before bonding curves, someone had to sell it to you, right? You want to buy a chair, someone's got to sell you a chair. You want, you want to sell a can of soup, someone's got to buy a can of soup. You want to buy Amazon stock, someone has to sell Amazon stock. But with a bonding curve, Bonding curve is just a smart contract that when you send money to it, it creates a token on demand and then sends it to you. And when it creates that token, it changes the price for future tokens. So then when someone wants to sell that token, the smart contract, smart contract is a program on the blockchain that holds money, right? So it holds the money that previous people used to buy the tokens. And so when you want to sell your token, you send the token to the smart contract, the, the bonding curve smart contract, and the bonding curve burns the token and releases some collateral. And so in this way, you don't need to find a partner to buy or sell with because the bonding curve handles it. So this is a, a really interesting novel economic primitive, which solves the low liquidity markets issue. And, and this is like a very advanced, this is a more advanced version of a bonding curve that we call the augmented bonding curve, which then is connected to another pool of funds 
that is used to actually do good work in the world. What we call a common pool. So uh, every time someone buys and sells out of the bonding curve, it actually sends money to the pool of funds that is used to produce value. And so the idea is we have this economic arm of the bonding curve, and we have this like value creation arm in the conviction voting. And then uh, when, when people buy or sell this token, it feeds the value creation arm either way. And then value creation <laughs> creates value, which then inspires people to want to be a part of the system. And then they buy tokens, and which, which then feeds more money into the common pool, which creates more value. And in this way, we can create a, a, a circular economy that supports value creation for public goods. Did that, did that answer the question about like the bonding curve and how it works? Well, I, I have. So is it better? Is it like if the initial, the, when the price is lower, does the price increase more quickly than when the price is higher or vice versa? Or is it linear? Well, that's the cool thing. Uh, it's, it's not linear, uh, but you can actually explore that. So it, it, it does, you could, you can set it in different ways because a bonding curve is just like, uh, you know, a, a price list. So it could do anything. It's kind of like a predetermined price list, but it's not based on time. It's based off of collateral that the curve has. So the more collateral that exists in the curve, the, um, it, it's, it, it really depends on the reserve ratio. The, so it's the reserve ratio is kind of an exponential term and it ends up be, being an exponential equation. The lower the reserve ratio, the, the higher the volatility is, the faster things move. And the higher the reserve ratio, uh, the lower the volatility is. So if you have a reserve ratio of 100%, then you have wrapped ether, right? Uh, like one ether comes in and then it's wrapped and you get one raft ether out, that would be a reserve ratio of 100%, and you'd have a very uh, like slow um, economy, right? <laughs> raft ether isn't much of an economy. Uh, but you could think of any wrap token wrapper as its own bonding curve with a reserve ratio of 100%, because uh, it's 100% collateralized. And so if you have a really high reserve ratio, um, it's, not, it, it's not linear. Anyway. I, I don't know. It's a hard question to ask, answer. But you can explore it with this tool. So you can set your settings and you can click 100K and you can see how the curve reacts. It will react faster relatively because like if you put 5K in at 100K, that's a larger percentage of the collateral pool. But if it has $5 million in it, then putting in 5K won't move the price much because it's a lower percentage of the collateral pool. I, I actually have a question for Vitor, because uh, one thing we haven't talked about is like actually how we vote and how uh, we like co collectively and iteratively design, uh, uh, create this economy. I don't know, Vitor, if you want to talk about like the GitHub issues and like forking things. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, basically, after you, you have a set of parameters, so in each mod you have um, a predefined number of parameters, and depending on your parameters, you have some outputs as well. And after you define them, you can go to the advanced settings, and then you can add some more advanced parameters that you might or might not change, but if you change, you change the modules as well. And after that, you can submit your proposal. And what it does is basically it generates a issue, an issue from a template with basically all of your parameters. After that, like we'll have a repository in which like every voting and every proposal will be there. And then we use a tool called token log in which uh, you can vote for which uh, proposal do you like the most. So you can vote in different proposals, for example, and we're going to use our hatch token. So the more uh, tokens you have from the hatch, the more vote power, voting power you have. It will not be linear, it will have like quadratic voting. So 
Uh, if you have more voting, you're not like linear, you have more power, but anyway. So after you have the issue, then uh, after we close the prime parties and the proposals, we'll vote and the, the, the proposals with more voting will be, will be selected. I think we have not defined like how exactly the process will be direct voting, etc. But basically that's it, like you're, you're going to define all of it, but then you will submit your proposal and then your parameters might be selected to, to do this economy. That's the, the next part. And the, the import feature, I don't know if you can show that. Oh, yeah, sure. And uh, basically, uh, you, can, you can either go directly to the website and start playing with it, or you can look at some proposals and you can, uh, for example, if you see an issue, and a proposal that you like an issue, and you just want to change one or two parameters, you can just go to the issue and click import parameters. And then you redirect to you to the website and you do a little bit of time to import the parameters. And then after that, it will render all of the modules with the parameters proposed. So basically, if you want to just explore the parameters from the issue and get sure that this is the best one, you can just click import and then go there. And or you can basically change one or two things. Since there are a lot of people, I think it will take a little while to import it, but yeah. That's that's the magic. I might have to clear my cache. That's all. I know yeah. Pedro has been working hard on this. Yeah, Pedro yeah. actually made a pull request during this call. <laughs> a, a, a hard refresh might might be what you need. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but this is the part is that you can you can either just like if you're now into uh, proposing, you just on. Uh, uh, get deeper into the, the proposals because like the issues uh, have uh, like the inputs and a few outputs but there are a few things that you gotta open the dashboard and play with so you can just click the import and see how it looks and see if you like this or if you just want to change something you can just change something and go back and uh, submit your proposal to to compete with the other one that you forked from and yeah that's the dynamics and, and I, I just want to say, I think this is the coolest part. This is where collaborative economics really comes in because <clears throat> we're taking something that was always happening in back rooms where people were just making decisions and then forcing it on the rest of the world. Like, you know, it happens obviously in normal economics with like Federal Reserve raising interest rates whenever, whenever they decide, right? It's not like we get to vote on it. Uh, and then, you know, and even in crypto, though, like who decided 10 minute blocks for Bitcoin? Who, who decided 32 Ether for staking on Ethereum? I don't remember a vote, right? And that's because economics is hard. But we have an opportunity to build an educated democracy and actually have debates, almost like political debates over our own economic futures. So uh, that's what's happening right now. And so with this tool, you can submit your own uh, proposal for the economy for a $1.5 million economy that will be launched in a month. And then you can debate it and you can present it and say, we do these param parties. And in the parties, people present their parameters and they say, hey, this is what I want. To, this is how I want the economy to be structured. And this is why I have these great ideas, right? And then people are like, oh, yeah, good economy. This is nice. Right. And then uh, and then we debate it and we say, well, why'd you do that? And what were you thinking there? Oh, that's cool. That's interesting. Right. And then that inspires other people. And people are like, I like that economy. But, you know, the conviction voting was a little slow for me. I'm going to fork it. And I'm going to just I'm going to keep what they did with the bonding curve and the token freezes. That was great. But the value creation arm, I'm just going to like tweak that a little bit. And here's my proposal that's iteratively like uh, an iteration of this previous one. And so together we can collectively and iteratively design the best economy we can. And we can do it with some music and having fun, you know? And that's why they're param parties. So we put some music on, we hang out, we have debates, and they're, they're really fun. In the, if you want to come and try your hand, uh, like during it, you can just kind of ask questions at the beginning. And like uh, we don't, we, at the first half of it is just for questions about designing stuff. And then the last half is the pr proposals. So there's a list of param parties in the community hall chat. There's a little graphic for the ones that are happening this week. And then uh, around, I think the deadline to, to, uh, for voting will be around November 16th. 
And uh, then we will have the, all of the proposals will be whittled down into just four, three, three to five. And we have a committee that has to kind of cho- look at the votes and make sure that there weren't any similar economies that kind of split votes, but that took them out of the top. So we have a little committee just to make sure there aren't any edge cases that need to be accounted for. And then, uh, then we'll have a runoff vote of the top four econ- the top three to five economies that were presented. So, uh, so yeah, it'll be super cool. Yeah. What system will be used to conduct the vote? I was just, I've been following Yang and the forward party and rank choice voting is one of his big things he's pushing for. We will use rank choice voting for the final part of it. Um, But uh, we're going to use quadratic voting on, uh, for the initial part. So when uh, we, we have this tool called token log, that Wesley, who works for the Ethereum Foundation, made its beautiful tool and allows you to basically use a, your token to vote quadratically on uh, on token log uh, on GitHub issues. And so we have each proposal as a GitHub issue, and we will use because we, we really like to yeah, mitigate the autocracy with quadratic voting. And then, but for the final, we will actually use rank choice voting to for people to rank their uh, favorite like final economies. And uh, that will be using Snapshot. I think we have time for one more question. Um, does anyone have one? Uh, okay, I have one for Marco uh, because he hasn't gotten to talk for a little bit. And I mean, I, I have to say, what was the most challenging user experience uh, in like challenging uh, user experience task to design for this dashboard? Yeah, uh, well, I just answer everything, right? Uh, because it was really hard to, um, like, you know, to pick an approach uh, and how, how to actually communicate all this stuff. And I don't think, like, well, yeah, we, did, we kind of did it right, but I, I don't think, like, there's a perfect solution to this. We try to educate tried not to overwhelm them with the information, but that was like inevitable. We had to do that. People have to read about it, have to learn about it. Uh, the most challenging part for me was, uh, I guess my goal was to avoid program parties, uh, even though they're fun and we need them. And I, I think we shouldn't actually avoid them because that's, that's the whole point of all this, right? We, you know, to have these program parties. Um, but, w- you know, we tried to, um, to communicate as much as possible in the interface itself and make it obvious um, and then transform all these complex mechanics uh, and, and make sense of them for the user. And that's really hard. And that's, that was really challenging. Uh, but for the most part of the whole uh, dashboard, I think the augment and bonding curve, because we we were so, you know, so, so much time on this and made so many revisions uh, and added a lot of features here and there. And it's so complex that, as Mitch said before, uh, it, you know, we could probably spend another month or, or, or more, you know, <laughs> working on this, uh, to get it, you know, even better. Um, so yeah, like overall, it's, it was really, really difficult. I'm still, I, I would say I'm, I'm happy of the outcome. I think we, we did a great job for this tool for the first time ever in human history. Uh, and for, you know, and, and for that reason, I'm just, you know, proud of that. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that in the future, we will probably find better ways on how to communicate this and how to convey all, like, all that information and parameters and how they're, like, interconnected and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, yeah, I'm just looking forward to that. Thanks for the question, by the way. It's a great question. Yeah, well, there is no shortage of UX challenges here. Uh, the whole thing. <laughs> well, yeah. well, we're at the top of the hour, and so I think we should call it. But thank you all so much for coming in. Come to a Param party. Try your hand. Design a common. You can actually choose. A, a geologist, a, a, a Nate, who's a geologist by training, 
made some incredible designs yesterday that blew my mind, blew everyone's mind with a conviction growth of 42 days and and uh, inch, and uh, and a spending limit or sorry, a minimum conviction of like a fraction of a percent and it looked great. You know, we there's uh there's it's really accessible to anyone to uh, decide how to uh, collect and and utilize this 1.5 million dollars that we have in the TEC and and put it into an economy. So you could be designing this. Uh, it's very accessible. Give it a shot. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you guys at the pram parties. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thank Thanks you so much for doing that. Thanks. Thank you.